history and culture. They believe she came from the far desert, and she is for sure from Mareb. They feel a honor because Queen of Sheba from their land, from their hometown. I hear tales of a beautiful young woman named Bilkis, who appeared from the dunes to assume the throne of the kingdom of Saba. To the sheikhs, there's no doubt that this kingdom here in Marib and the biblical land of Sheba are one and the same. <laughs> In the holy books. Yes, and the Quran. The Quran also tells vivid stories about the kingdom that Bilqis ruled. And what's more, where to find its remains. It was a heaven. Saba have two heavens. The sheikhs explain that the land of Saba is described in the Quran as land of the two paradises. The name comes from two oases created by a massive dam the Sabaeans built here in Marib, a dam whose ruins, they tell me, can still be seen nearby. It sounds like I need to go to see this dam and to explore Marib further. Do I have the permission of the sheikhs to do so? It's like a permission for you ah. to go anywhere. Okay. And so uh, if I have their permission, that's all I need. Shukran. Oh. Yeah. And thank you for this. My evening with the sheikhs went over very well. Not only did I gain their permission to explore their land, but the stories they told me about the Queen of Sheba have inspired me. Now my goal is to search for archaeological evidence to support their stories. I've arranged to meet archaeologist Zaydun Zaid at the Marib Dam to tell me more. So this is one of the towers of the Dam of Marib. Yeah, this is the north tower, that's right. Where's uh, the other one? The south tower, just ahead of your eyes, that part, you see it? There, oh, wow, the south one. Wow. So there was a wall going the between The dam's this wall stretched from where we're standing all the way to the south tower, over 2,000 feet away. That made it about twice as wide as the Hoover Dam. The water it controlled was used to irrigate the valley below, supporting an estimated 35 to 50,000 people. So this really must have been a lush green valley. Well, it, it, as you can see now, it's still green. And you yeah. can imagine at that time, it was much, much, much better. more. Yeah. The water was, which was coming out of here was supporting at the two sides of it, something like paradise. Two at two sides of them, one at the right, one at the left. Oh, I've right. heard about this. So this is the left paradise and the right paradise. Exactly. That's, uh. that's it. The dam worked by collecting runoff from the mountains and then channeling the water into sluice gates on either side of the two towers. The gates, in turn, led to canals that branched into the valley below, creating the oases that gave Saba the name Land of the Two Paradises. As Zaydun and I make our way to the South Tower, I ask him what led to the collapse of this incredible structure and the civilization that built it. There's two theories about it. One which will say that the dam was destroyed by a strong earthquake. Zaydun says that an earthquake may have toppled the dam, or an unusually heavy rainy season could have damaged it beyond repair. In either case, the march of history also played a part. A shift in trade routes away from their territory had already dramatically weakened the kingdom, and they were unable to recover from the loss of the dam. What I've seen so far supports what I've heard about a flourishing civilization. But what about the queen? It's thought she would have reigned in the 10th century BC. So oh, here we are. Josh. Wow. Does the archaeological evidence here date back far enough? Well, uh, the construction of the dam went through different phases, and what we are looking, in fact, at the latest of it. Well, Inscriptions the on the tower are written in the same Sabaean script I first saw in Ethiopia. Though they date this phase of the dam to the 7th century BC, after the time of the queen, Zaydun tells me that this is only the latest construction. Its origins go back far earlier. The Sabaeans continually updated and improved their dam over centuries. The Sabaean civilization managed to block this canyon 
in 1500 BC. So they finished building the dam at that point. But the history of damming using water goes back up to 3200 BC. If this is true, the Sabaean civilization in Marib would have existed at the time the queen made her journey to Jerusalem. In fact, it would have been thriving. All that remains is to find her, and Zaydun has an answer for that, too. So it would, it would make sense that somewhere in this region is a palace, and perhaps a queen. A queen with a temple. And is that true? Is there some place around here where that exists? Yeah, exactly. The temple of the Queen of Sheba. Right here. Right here. My search for the Queen of Sheba has taken me across the world and thousands of years back in time. In a religious archive, I heard the stories of her journey to Jerusalem to visit King Solomon. In Ethiopia, I learned that frankincense could have provided her with the wealth she was famous for. Here in Yemen, I discovered that she and her civilization appear in the Quran and in the oral traditions of the local people. I've now come to the possible seat of her civilization, a sand-swept temple that bears her name, Mahram Bilkis, the sanctuary of the Queen of Sheba. To learn what it reveals of the queen, I'm meeting up with another extraordinary woman. Marilyn Phillips Hodgson of the American Foundation for the Study of Man has been excavating here for nearly a decade. Before we explore the temple, Marilyn and I must pay our respects to the sheikh who watches over the site. Sheikh Marzouk and his sons keep a close eye on the Mahram Bilkis, the centerpiece of their heritage, and they want to be sure of my intentions. I'm grateful that the sheikh is welcoming me because he's packing a lot of heat. My explorations here in Marib have attracted some attention. And while I have the blessing of the tribes to be here, I still have to tread carefully. After some friendly diplomacy, we're given the go-ahead to explore the temple grounds. So, so this wall, this was the first thing discovered here? Well, sure, because everything else was covered by sand. Marilyn tells me that the entire complex encompasses 37 acres, making it the largest ancient temple in the entire Arabian Peninsula. But only a small percentage of it has actually been excavated. Working here is a never-ending battle against the blowing sands, which rebury much of the site between digging seasons. I asked Marilyn how she came to work in such a forbidding place. I came here because I wanted to fulfill my brother's unfinished dreams, but now it's my passion. The Mahram Bilkis was first excavated by Marilyn's brother, Wendell Phillips, in the early 1950s. When he began, the site was almost entirely covered in sand. And though his dig lasted only one season, he uncovered a wealth of artifacts. So your brother brings his archaeological team here. They start excavating. What happened? They found many, many exciting, wonderful treasures. One of the greatest is, I happen to have a picture here to show you. Oh, yeah. It's every, every Yemeni has a picture of it because it's on the 50 real note. Wow. Wow, so this was such an exciting find that they actually put it on their money. That's right. More than four feet high warrior. One of the rulers of this great area. That's impressive. It is. The statue that Wendell Phillips found is considered to be one of the masterpieces of Sabaean art. It depicts a ruler called the Mahdi Karib, complete with a jambia at his waist. This statue from the 6th century BC helped put a face to the queen's glorious civilization. Unfortunately, Wendell was never able to finish his work. Tribal strife forced him to flee Marib after just four months on the site. He didn't want to leave. It was a terrible heartbreak. They left all their cars, all the artifacts, everything remained behind. So after making these world-class discoveries, he has to flee for his life? Yes. So what happens to this site? It filled up with sand, and only the great pillars showed there, uh -huh. and uh, the Awam enclosure, the Great Wall. This space that we're sitting in now, 18 feet above us, was, was all sand. All sand. Wow. Nearly 50 years passed before Marilyn and her team were able to return to Marib. Since work has resumed, the foundation has unearthed much more of the site. 
This is like the Library of Congress then. Yes. We're joined by the assistant site director, Yemeni archaeologist Abdu Ghalib who shows me some of their recent discoveries. So anything that had to do with daily life or was important to them, they put on these stones. They built it too. The Mahram Bilqis is literally covered in inscriptions from top to bottom. The elegant South Arabian script that I've seen throughout my journey adorns nearly every surface of the temple. This inscription talking about social, economic, and about the, the tribes, the names, and what they believe, you know. Abdu tells me that all aspects of daily life were recorded here from ritual dedications to social and economic histories. And the foundation's team has only scratched the surface. So, below this. Below, below this. Yeah. Below this goes back to the 8th century BC, but it's covered now by sand again. So if you were to dig down. If you dig down, you will go down, 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 15 meters. Like the Great Dam of Marib, the Mahram Bilqis was improved and expanded over successive generations. To date, they have yet to find any inscriptions referring to the Queen of Sheba. But the deeper they dig, the further back in time they go, and thus closer to the time of the Queen. I ask Abdu in Maryland if what they've found can shed any light on the legends I've heard throughout my journey. This is the main gate of the temple. They take me to a newly discovered area of the temple, where they show me a grand staircase decorated with antelope heads. I've seen these before in Ethiopia. And both cultures claim to have this belief that the Queen of Sheba is from their homeland. Yeah, because the Queen of Sheba is the Queen of Saba. You know, uh, she's a Sabaean uh, queen, and the people who lived and, in Ethiopia and established the kingdom of Ethiopia are Sabaean people. Wow. So this helps explain the Ethiopians' beliefs that they're descended from the Queen of Sheba. In a way, they are, or at least from her civilization. Why you see the similar decoration and, and writing. Yeah, and writing. So that this was the center. I mean, actually, we're standing at the center of the Sabian civilization. Yes. And if the Queen of Sheba, which sounds like it, if the Queen of Sheba lived here, then her influence would have spread throughout her domain, and that, you said, went into Ethiopia. Exactly. And that's why they believe that, they, that she was their queen as well. Yeah, that's, wow. that's right. It is, it, you know, Marilyn and Abdu have you. one last thing they yeah. want me to see. Yeah. At the top of the staircase, they bring me to a wall covered in sand and invite me to help them dig. Okay. Abdu explains that they rebury this treasured artifact after each season to protect it from the elements. Look at that. That's a face. As we clear away the sand, I can see why they take so much care. Who found this? Me and Marilyn when we were digging here in 2001. That must have been pretty exciting. Yeah, oh, it was. Okay. <laughs> it was very exciting. Look at yeah. that. So. Every time you see it, what do you think? It, it became difference. more beautiful. More beautiful? Yes. You know. This is my favorite discovery. Even though it's not as early as the time of the Queen of Sheba, I'm sure that when we do see the tattoo of the Queen of Sheba, she will be something like this. It's clear that the Mahram Bilqis is an incredible archaeological site. Every season of digging reveals more about the remarkable Sabaean civilization and brings Marilyn and Abdu closer to finding the real Queen of Sheba. She speaks to you. She says, keep digging. Yeah, we'll keep digging. And to think that just by digging another 10 meters, you could come face to face with the most famous queen in the world. Yeah, somewhere we are going to find the Queen of Sheba. So you don't believe it's a question of if, but just a question of when? It's a question of time and a question of work. So we're going to find her here. My mission to uncover the real story of the Queen of Sheba has been a success. I haven't found her yet, but I have found her civilization and learned firsthand how she became so important to cultures in both South Arabia and the Horn of Africa. Perhaps Marilyn and Abdu will find her here, and perhaps 